This morning, we turn to Hebrews chapter 12. This is our guiding passage here in our Pillars of the Faith series, our summer series where we're going through some of the pillars, if you will, the men and women from the Old Testament who set the foundation of, um, for our revelation of who God was, how he interacts with people. We're learning not just about who these people are, but ultimately we learn their story to discover more about God. Okay, because the revelation of Scripture is not a revelation of people. Does it reveal things about the human heart? Absolutely. But this is God's revelation of himself to humanity. So anytime individual stories are connected there, there's a reason because God wants to reveal something about himself and his relationship to us. And so Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to start with verse 1 through the first part of verse 2. If you would and are able to see this, read it together with me this morning as this is our guiding passage throughout the summer. Therefore, read it together, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Lord Jesus, we open up ourselves to you today, for we are here to meet with you this morning And Lord, we open up ourselves to your inspired word today that we might draw closer to you this morning. Lord, don't allow us to leave the same in which we came. Oh, what a wasted time this would be if we weren't somehow touched and transformed in your presence this morning, Lord. We submit this time to you. Be with our team as they return here to the middle of the state. We thank you for the impact that they made and for the relationships that have started. We pray for our friends in West Virginia that, Lord God, that you might bless that church, that you might flourish them in the coming weeks and months. Lord, we just pray abundant blessing upon them, Lord God, for your gospel's sake. The Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear hearts to receive, encouraged to obey all that you want to speak to our souls this morning. And all of God's people said a big amen. Amen. So Hebrews chapter 12 reminds us of this great cloud of witnesses, um, those that have gone before us, this witnesses of the life of faith. And before we retell the story of Joseph and the spectacular sin of his brothers and that global purpose <coughs> in the glory of Jesus Christ, what I'd like to do just for a moment is to go back to Genesis chapter 12, where God chooses Abraham from all the peoples of the world by his own free grace and owing him nothing, of course. Genesis chapter 12, this is really where the story begins for us, he tells Abraham, the father of Israel, I will bless you and make you a great name so that you will be a blessing, so that you will be a blessing, so that you will be a, we're blessed to be a, we're blessed to be a blessing. We're not blessed just to remove discomfort from our life. We're not um, blessed just to have every part of our needs taken care of. We are blessed to be a blessing. He said, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in all, your, all the families of earth shall be blessed. So at the very beginning of this covenant relationship with his chosen people, Soon thereafter, in Genesis chapter 12 and 13 and the chapters which follow, God eventually does predict a 400-year stay in Egypt. 
So after this blessing, if you will, after this covenant relationship, God up front speaks of this 400 years in Egypt, followed by a return to the promised land, of which we then get to know Moses and his story. They'll be afflicted for 400 years. Um, He actually has a strange reason why um, there must be a leave of about 400 centuries, or four centuries, excuse me. And we see that in Genesis chapter 15, in the middle of that chapter, around, I think it's around verse 16, we get a chance to see where the Lord tells um, about this 400-year captivity, but this 400-year period, and he says, let me read it to you here, it says, the iniquity of the Ammonites are not yet complete. He begins to speak of the sin of the land of Canaan, this promised land that we eventually come in contact to um, in the Exodus as Moses is introduced at the tail end of this 400 years, that the sin of the land while it was there, it was not to the level of purging out that land the Lord Lord foresaw. He didn't um, speak that into existence, but he just foresaw the sin that would grow to a place where it had to be then purged from the land. This is not too uncommon in the Genesis narrative, because if you remember just a few short chapters prior, whenever we get the chance to see about Noah and the flood that would cover over the earth, why? Because the th- every thought and intent of humanity was always and constantly evil. Sin had grown to such a place that there had to be this purging, if you will, so that God's blessing might flow. Let me say that again. There had to be the purging of the sin so that God's blessing might flow. It's not that just that God gets upset or angry or disgusted and wants to wipe people away, but in order for his goodness to flow, at some point, evil must be pushed back. This is oftentimes why, even in our own personal lives, where we wonder why God's grace continues to be offered as at times we, we struggle and as we fail in our quest and in our relationship with him. Why is God still putting up with me? It's because there's still hope. And the Lord will orchestrate certain events in our life so that there might be a cleansing once again within us. But God's grace, his goodness is what he desires to flow through our lives. But don't you know, God does not bless sin. God does not bless sin in our life. He does not bless sin in a nation Now, there's not always immediate judgment. There's not always immediate punishment there. There's not always an immediate purging because there's chance after chance after chance after chance. Thank God that we serve a God of chances with his great grace. But there does become a place, become a time, Whenever the Lord says enough is enough, evil has run rampant sometimes in our hearts, in our lives, in our family, or in a nation, and here an entire piece of land where God after these 400 years will say enough and he will begin to move his people because the sin of the Ammonites, the sin of the people of Canaan of this promised land will reach a level of which there is no turning back. And so it must be cleansed. And of course, Israel will be a part of that. So whenever Israel does come back and to take the land under Joshua, um, there's a slight um, bit of that with Moses as he leads them there. But of course, they're disobedient. And so Joshua, after 400 years, they come back and Joshua leads them to destroy these nations. But then Deuteronomy chapter 9, if you're taking notes, verse 5 He actually gives some insight into even why Israel is being used here. And he says this, not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess their land. You know, soon thereafter, there's this terminology change, which as soon as it becomes 
um, your land, but up until this point, still their land. But it's because of the wickedness of these nations of the Lord your God is driving them out before you that he may confirm the world that the Lord swore to your father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So this is kind of the backdrop. Even before we get to Joseph and his story and the sins of his brothers and, and all the atrocities that happened to him, all this takes place really as a setup to what God has already spoken into existence. Out of his foresight, out of his foreknowledge of all the centuries that would come, Joseph plays a small part. But yet, his story covers multiple chapters. So we get to see it beginning with Abraham. Now, from Adam, the first man, all the way to Abraham, there's about a, a 2,100 years it's been about 600 years since the flood before Abraham. And, and um, of course, we see Abraham. He has his son Isaac. Isaac has Jacob and Esau, um, these two boys of which Jacob then would be the carrier of the covenant, as it were, although Esau had a part in that as well. Jacob would be which that covenant was carried out. Joseph is his second to last son, of 12, and Joseph, as one of the sons, he was the youngest for much of the time before eventually his, son, his brother Benjamin was born, he became the favorite. And let me kind of bring us up to speed. Some of you are very familiar with Joseph's story, but he was the favorite of these sons, 11, and eventually the 12th son, his own um, brother from his own mother. There's a couple, couple wives here involved. And Joseph, because of the favoritism, if you will, causes much discord in the family. As you could well imagine. You know, if they're, you try to do everything as even as possible as parents. And perhaps, Mark, I don't know how your family runs, but, you know, for my family, if you say, well, you know, there's, there's a piece of cake for everybody... But there's two pieces for the son that we really love. I don't know how well that would go over in your household. And can you imagine day after day, year after year, they get, well, double the amount of Christmas presents, double the amount of birthday presents, food, they get the best steak. And beyond that, Mom is still willing to cut up the steak for them, even at 15 years of age. I don't know if that ever happened. And, but everybody else is on their own. The favoritism got into the nature, if you will, of the family. And how many people here are either a part of a family or you have a family where there's more than one boy in the home? So you know about brotherly love. At some point, boys go at it. I mean, brothers grab, you know, and, and the closer in age that they are, um, they tend to, even when there's a lot of love there, at some point, it all hits a fan and, man, sparks will fly. Well, can you imagine having 11 or 12 of them? And now, all of a sudden, the youngest of the 11 is the favored, and the older boys are saying, enough is enough. And to some degree, while Joseph was kind of a, a cocky little punk, I feel sorry for him a little bit because mom and dad kind of set him up for this, because the unfairness. But this is all part of God's plan. Nothing is wasted of the Lord. It's not that the Lord set that into motion, but let me say it again. Nothing is wasted on the Lord. In your life, perhaps you're the Joseph or perhaps you're one of the other brothers. No matter which side you're sitting on, nothing is wasted on the Lord. The experiences that you've gone through, that you've persevered, that bring you to your situation today, nothing is wasted when you're with the Lord. 
It's important for us to realize this whenever we start this story of Joseph because eventually there'd be a lot of heartache coming Joseph's way. While for the first years of his life, he was very protected and pampered and cared for and favored. Now he would turn the corner as his father would then give him a coat of many colors to remind everybody else that he's a favorite. It wasn't enough to be the unspoken rule. Now it was the visual rule. And then... Soon he would be sent on an errand as he was protected in the household. His brothers were out working in the sun. In the Middle Eastern heat, they were sent out to find pasture land. And there they are working. And so Joseph is sent out by his father. Go see how your brothers are doing and bring me back a report. He was the ultimate tattletale. And his brothers knew it. So as he approached them, he came in. As they saw him coming from a far ways away, they said, we're done with our little brother reporting on us. We're done with him rubbing our noses in it. We're done with him um, I'm telling us what to do. Come, let us kill him. Now one of his brothers stepped in and said, well, let's not kill him. Let's not have blood on our hands. So they took him, they beat him threw him into a pit, into a well, if you will, and there they um, were plotting on how to kill him, and eventually they were told to sell, they eventually sold him into slavery. There, once he's in slavery, because the favor of God, you know, the favor of God's so interesting because no matter where you're at, no matter the injustices around you, that if you don't short circuit and shoot yourself in the foot, God's favor follows you. Let me say that one more time. God's favor follows you no matter what's going on around you. No one in your life except for you can short circuit God's favor. The reason I say no one but you, because God, as we established a few moments ago, God does not bless sin. And so whenever there's sin in our life, whenever we live in rebellion, whenever we curse God because of the circumstances around us, we can short circuit his favor in our life. But whenever we live humbly before the Lord, no matter what else everybody else is doing around us, nothing can short circuit the favor God has over your life. And we get a chance to see this. He's sold into slavery. Soon he finds himself in Potiphar's house. He is a cruel man. He is a strong man. He's a powerful man in the nation of Egypt, in the kingdom, if you will, of Egypt, because it covers much more than just Egypt itself. At this point, they are the world power. And here he is, the chief of all the prison systems of that day and age. And, and trust me, they did not have Wi-Fi in those prison systems. They didn't have the three square meals. Um, they didn't have ESPN and everything else. Not that they're great places to be now, quite frankly. But they were atrocities back then. And here's Potiphar in charge of all that's going on. A hard man, but because the favor of the Lord was upon Joseph's life. Soon he rises in this household with many employees, with many servants, with the plus nature of one, being one of the top people in the kingdom. And here Joseph rises up and now Potiphar has to think of nothing for his own household because Joseph takes care of everything. But here, once again, injustice happens to Joseph's life. Right, to the Potiphar's wife, sees him, she's attracted to him. Physically, I'm sure she was attracted to his confidence as a, as a young man um, in charge of all her, um, her husband's affairs. And here she makes a false claim because Joseph stood uprightly, would not have sexual relationships with her. He said this would be, he didn't just say this would be wrong, I'm afraid of Potiphar, but this would also be a sin against God. Who was his eye still on? The God of his father Abraham, the God of his father Isaac, the God of his father Jacob that they had taught him to fear and respect. And as the sovereign over all, even in the land of captivity, Joseph still was honoring God. 
where some of us might have said, well, God's forsaken me. Why would I forsake myself at least a little bit of pleasure in this God-forsaken place? But yet, no, not for Joseph. This would be a sin against God. And so it got to a place where eventually she grabbed his cloak in order to try to force him, if you will, and try to convince him. And he runs away, leaving his cloak behind. And, and there the false claims are made. And, and I don't know about you, but whenever somebody's in charge of the prison systems, um, that's not the person you want on your bad side in that day and age. And so he's thrown in, not into a white-collar jail. He's thrown into... The hardcore, into the slammer. These are the people who, who tried to assassinate the king. These would have been murderers. These would have been the worst, some of the worst of the worst. And even here, the favor of God follows him. And it's this beautiful truth of scripture that Elton Trueblood and many of his books that I've written, he says that the people of God assures the presence of God. Wherever you go, God goes. And here, this is the case, even in the prison system, forgotten there for years. And perhaps you know Joseph's story. Eventually there's two dreams, the people who were accused of trying to kill the king. One was eventually beheaded. The other one brought back to his place, but even then he was forgotten about. Joseph, because of his candid ability given by God to interpret dreams, eventually appears before the Pharaoh, the king of that day and age, interprets his dream. Now he becomes the second in all of the kingdoms of Egypt. And there he rules. We see no evidence of Joseph ever trying to go back to find his family. We never see any evidence of Joseph trying to Redeem those years. There's this quiet confidence about Joseph. Even whenever his own family eventually shows up during a, a severe famine in all the land, after seven years of plenty, then there's seven years of famine. We never see Joseph, hear me this morning, moving backwards. We never see Joseph stuck in the past. You know, and that's very significant because oftentimes with deep hurt, with abandonment, with struggles, with abuse, sometimes we find ourselves stuck by past events. Like anchors to our soul, they keep rising up. But somehow, some way, for Joseph, he had moved past all these things. His faith in God was supreme over all. And somehow, with the presence of God, he was able to release all that before the Lord so that he could be used fully in the present. And for many of us here this morning, this is a message that Joseph wants to bring about enduring faith, is that sometimes in order to have enduring faith, we must be released from the past in order to be able to move on to the future. It's not that we ignore them, it's not that we excuse them, it's not that we condone whatever happened in the past. But praise the Lord, he knows what we need in the present and the future as well. And so he somehow released these things before him. Eventually his brothers appear before him. There's this entire process that I will not go through. They come and get food before, for, from Joseph. They don't realize that it's him. They're reconciled as a family even amidst all the atrocities that have happened. Soon, well, I say soon, a decade or two later, their father, Jacob, dies. And the brothers, still remembering their sin, the guilty conscience knows no limits. They think to themselves, uh-oh, dad's dead. Joseph is going to get us now. He didn't touch us before out of honor for his father, our father, but now dad's out of the way, we're in for it. And so they send word to Joseph and um, they lie about um, Jacob's last, Abraham, 
uh, Jacob's last wish about not her harming the boys and uh, the brothers. And Joseph sees right through it because he's already let it go. He's already forgiven. He's already released those pains before the Lord. And Joseph sees through their, their lies and their manipulation. And this is where it brings us to this passage in Genesis chapter 50. And if you have your own scriptures or if you have your digital Bible on your phone or your iPad this morning, I would encourage you to open it up to your own portion of scripture, Genesis chapter 50. And I want to read to you verses 19 through 21. This is Joseph's reply. And the reason why we're going to hang our hats for the remaining of our time together is because it summarizes Joseph's view of God by his interaction with his brothers. His response to those that offended and hurt him shows his view of God. In verse 19 of Genesis chapter 50, he says this, but Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? Could he have punished them? Absolutely. He was second in command. Anything that he said, goat. I mean, he had carte blanche authority over anything that he spoke of outside of, um, of Pharaoh's own household and family. Verse 20, he says, though, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. There's this beautiful practical theology woven throughout his response where the truth that he was taught early on about God through the atrocities of life now have become convictions of his soul so he could speak purely back to his brothers. The first truth that we see comes out of this is simply this. Number one, he realized God is in control. Joseph replied to them, do not be afraid of me and my God that I can punish you. Should I take this into my own hands? Am I in control? I mean, I know I hold a high position, but God still sits sovereign on the throne. He is the judge. He will, if there's a vengeance to be had, he will avenge me, but I will not take matters into my own hands. Am I God that I should punish you? You know, our, our lives, Joseph realized, belong to him. There's this great confidence that we see in Joseph's response. God's in control. God's got it. I mean, you don't get to that place easily, friends. You get to that place after much heartache, after much struggle, after overcoming great challenges, that eventually you get to look back and see God's handiwork in your life and say, wow, but God. I'm not here. God is in control. Joseph recognizes his role, even with his unlimited power and authority. He just realizes I'm God's servant. If God's in control, then I'm there to serve him. I mean, this is a truth woven throughout Scripture. Isaiah chapter 41 speaks of this later on, much later on. The prophet Isaiah says, Do not fear God says, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. For some of us this morning, we need to come to the conclusion that God is in control, and we need to let our hands of control off. We're trying to, to protect us, protect others. We're trying to manipulate circumstances in our life. And at some point, we have to let go and let God. The turmoil in your own heart that drives us to crazy types of behavior, oftentimes um, they stem from desiring to control 
whenever we feel out of control, our behaviors reflect. After all, God is omnipotent. He is the all-powerful one. All power is within his hand. God is in control. The second thing that we see is um, this beautiful truth woven from Genesis all the way through Revelation. We get to see this throughout Scripture, that God intends everything for good. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. This is a crazy statement. Can I, can I just say this as your pastor? Uh, on face value, how is abandonment by family good? How is beatings, literal physical beatings to the point of death by your own family's hand good? How is the injustice of a man of character being accused of something that he refused to be a part of and then being sent over to jail? And by the way, whenever you're sent to jail in that day and age, it wasn't just like this, this nice thing where they cuff you and put you in a, a, a padded um, seat. I'm sure Potiphar let him have it as well. We just don't read of it because um, now he's an official as these words are being recorded. Some things you don't write down for certain reasons whenever you're in a power of authority. And, and so we get to say, how could that be good? How could be time and jail? But yet he has this perspective, number one, God's in control. And then he says, you intended it to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He began to get this global generational perspective of what God was up to and he was not confined to his own little looking glass of what was happening just for Joseph. I struggle with that because so many times I see the pain, I feel the frustration, I know the turmoil in my own heart and I don't like to look outside of me. But whenever we begin to widen the lens of our life, as we allow God, we, number one, accept his control, and then we're able to say God has intended everything for good. It's then that we get a chance to read passages like Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It reads this passage of scripture that perhaps we're very familiar with. Verse 28, he says, we, and we know... That God works, causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. But you know, we we're familiar with this passage, but it actually begins earlier in verse 26, if we can go to the next slide, where it says, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, in our trials, in our pains, in our hurts. This word for weaknesses isn't just about limitations. It's about things that have wounded us. And the Holy Spirit helps us with those things, he says. And the Holy Spirit prays for us. And it says, and the Spirit pleads for us, believers in harmony with God's will. You see, it's, it's within this backdrop that we see there that then we can read with confidence, verse 28, that Romans says that God works for the, um, good of, uh, together for the good of everything in our life for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So we are then understand whenever we have the Holy Spirit working on our behalf, we have God himself working on our behalf, that there is no situation that I can get myself into that God can't get me out of. Let me say that again. There's no situation I can get myself into that God can't get me out of. Joseph, he had some crazy situations. We had time and time again, the purposes for, of God were fulfilled. I have a picture here of a plane that I wanted to read to you, this story that was written some time ago. A man was telling the story some years ago. He says, when I was flying, learning to fly, my instructor told me to put the plane into a steep and extended dive. 
I was totally unprepared for what was about to happen. After a brief time, the engine stalled and the plane began to pull out of control. It soon became evident that my instructor was not going to help me at all. After a few seconds, which seemed like an eternity, my mind began to function again. He says, I quickly corrected the situation. He was able to restart the engine, pull it back within control. Immediately, he says, I I turned to the instructor and began to vent my fearful frustrations on him. He very calmly said to me, there is no position you can get this airplane into that I cannot get you out of. If you want to learn to fly, he said, go up there and do it again. You know, there are times in our life whenever we feel like we're in a nosedive. Whenever we feel out of control. But just like this instructor was training him, he was testing his skills so that he could be a a, a well-rounded, a a, a well-equipped, a well-prepared pilot. Sometimes the effects of our lives that go around, the things that get us to where we're at today, are part of God's process in forming us. And one truth I've learned years ago is that a faith that hasn't been tested is a faith that can't be trusted. Our faith is tested, it's proved, it's formed, it's solidified by the events of life. While the events themselves may not be good, praise God, he is working out good for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. God doesn't call everything good, but he causes. He causes everything to work together for your good. And so God is in control. God intends everything for good. And finally, God positions us with purpose. Everything leads to God's final end. Joseph says, he brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people and I will continue to care for you and your children. Everything led to God's final end. God positioned him in this place. He, He positioned him. God's positions are not without their pains. Joseph experienced loneliness He was pressured with temptation. He could have allowed bitterness to enter into his heart. And certainly, some would say the greatest test of all was his power that now he held. None of which was his, he said. I don't own the power, nor do I embrace the loneliness. I resist the temptation And I refuse to allow bitterness to empty, enter into his heart. And then he summarizes the events of his life with his two purposes. I'm here to save people and to take care of my family. Let that sink in for a moment. I'm here to save people. I'm here to care for my family. He had perhaps the hardest job known in all human history. But he was able to boil it down to those two items. Save people. Care for my family. How will we be judged? My guess is probably very similarly. According to the position that God has set us up for our purpose. For I am here to save people and care for my family. You're here to save people, to care for your family. Micah, chapter 6, one of the minor prophets, he summarizes it very similarly. He has shown you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. If there's one verse in all the scripture that was not intended to summarize Joseph's life, can I use this to implant upon Joseph this morning to act justly, to love mercy, and oh my goodness, did he ever walk humbly 
before his God. If anybody had a, a human reason why not to do these things, he had them, but yet he still understood God was in control. God was using all the circumstances in his life to bring about some type of good and that God had positioned him for this divine purpose. So he acted justly. Why did Pharaoh trust him? Because he was just. He loved mercy. How could he reconcile with his family? Because of the mercy he extended toward those around him. And oh my goodness, did he ever walk humbly before his God. What does the Lord require of us? To act justly. To love mercy. When's mercy needed? Whenever the greatest offense is there. Mercy does not come when someone deserves it. It, Mercy is extended whenever someone least deserves it. Shrewsbury Assembly of God, could we be that type of church? I don't know about you. I love being in environments where mercy is extended. Where not all my faults are always pointed out. Whenever I'm weakest, It's not whenever I'm attacked the most. Perhaps, not just at church on a Sunday morning, but throughout the week, maybe even our families could be a place where we offer mercy, we extend grace. In our closest of family relationships, in our friendships, and oh, that we may walk humbly, with our God, saying God is in control, I'm not. I'm his servant, he's the master. God is in control, Joseph realized. He realized that God is working everything together for the good. How did he have enduring faith? He realizes these truths and that God positions him with his divine purpose. And friends, He positions you and me as well. He positions us in different locations, in different circumstances, with different jobs, with different history. But the ultimate purpose is to save people and to care for our family. And if I could encourage you towards your purpose, in fact, we talked a little bit about personal purpose last week. At some point, it'll look differently, but at some point, it's all woven into this one piece here to save people from eternal damnation, or this is the purpose of Jesus. I came to seek and save that which is lost, Jesus said. And then he extends to us the ministry of reconciliation and then to care for our family, to care for those. How did Jesus put it? Our neighbors. Who's your neighbor? Who are you called to care for? That's our purpose. And we get to see this in Joseph's life as he summarizes his enduring faith. Would you bow in a word of prayer with me this morning? Lord, we thank you to follow the story of a man like Joseph. Not because it points to his greatness, but the demonstrates for us today your greatness to a life through his life that fully trusts in you. Lord, we confess this morning that oftentimes we we struggle with the things that I'm sure Joseph struggled with at some point, but he got victory from. As he dealt with the loneliness of his own heart, the abandonment of his own family, the bitterness that could have crept in, the pain that was caused, the scars emotionally as well as physically he'd endured the injustices that he faced. 
Oh, Lord Jesus. Might we be freed from that which hinders us and slows us down. As we learn of this next, this, this pillar of the faith, Joseph, Lord God, we see him stripping away all those things and, and, and also the sins that could have easily entangled his life along the way. That he might be one of the witnesses, this great huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. And this morning, we release those things from us as well, Lord God. It might be pain, it might be heartache, it might be sin, it might be injustice, it might be loneliness, it might be fear, it might be addiction. Whatever it is, Lord, we begin that process. We begin that decision today of releasing it before you, that you might work your miraculous healing work in us. That we can run the race of faith ourselves and cross the finish line. To hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. We release those before you today. On this week of our country's freedom, may we see the freedom that Joseph endured in a foreign land, but under your reign. We give it all to you today. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen.